colleagues, dear friends. I am happy uh, that I can be with you, uh, connected here uh, via Skype. Uh, unfortunately, I am not with you face to face. And um, though I wanted this to do, um, uh, but there are two circumstances why I can't do this. So one circumstance is that I am not as mobile enough uh, to make big journeys uh, because my uh, my Achilles tendon was ruptured. And the second thing is that two days ago my mother passed away. And uh, for that reason, I hope you will understand that I will just um, deliver this um, uh, speech and uh, will not attend any other session of your important event. Okay. Um, so, you see the title, first slide, it's about Foundations of Hope for a Global Sustainable Information Society. Second slide, please. Um, what's the uh, content of it? I will talk about the Great Bifurcation. I will talk about the Global Sustainable Information Society. And you might have noticed that I have changed uh, the title of the um, of my talk, the program. In the program it is conocimiento. Uh, uh, this is not false. Uh, this is this is true. This is very right. It's correct. But uh, in my systems view, uh, those of you who attended last time, you know that I am a systems uh, a theoretician. Theorist, uh, so uh, knowledge is just um, uh, a subdivision of information, and so we can use the term information society. Third chapter is about global consciousness, and then I will uh, conclude. So let's begin with the first, the next slide, slide number three, please. Yes. So. It is the global challenges, which is uh, the most uh, important uh, thing here to mention. This is the starting point of all our considerations. We live in the age of global challenges. What are global challenges? Global challenges are due to disparities in social relations. And there are um, a variety of social relations. So there is one among humans, as seems clear. But there is also social relations between humans and nature and there are social relations between humans and technology. So, if we come to slide 4, first, uh, the first thing, so it, that is... Subsystems of all of this. Um, slide number five. 
if we talk about disparities in the relations between humans and the environment, so this is an alienation from nature, that is, nature does what it uh, wants and it does not do what we want it to do, or her to do, and so this is uh, the notion of Gaia. Gaia is said uh, to be a living organism, that's the whole planet, and we are said to be a kind of cancer. Hum hum humans are a kind of cancer for this Gaia. So that's the reason why we have these environmental catastrophes. Slide number six. Uh, there is also an alienation from technology, because there are these disparities between humans and technology which demonstrate themselves, which manifest in technological disasters. So, this is always to say that there is something which has very big uh, consequences and consequences which are detrimental for society and for humans and uh, that is, we don't have uh, these things uh, under control all these things are out of control because uh, the relations uh, don't, uh, don't uh, work anymore. Slide number seven, please. For that reason, the global challenges threaten the continuation of humanity through another world war and environmental catastrophes. That is, this is the objective factor. That is, uh, that is how it is. And uh, the second thing is that uh, not only all humanity is affected by it, but it must be also all humanity that is effective in order to meet these global challenges and to find out whether there are solutions to it. Um, and this is the subjective factor, that there is a need uh, for global consciousness. Slide number eight, please. So, that means we have the choice now. The choice is either there is a breakdown of the interdependent world system if we don't change anything, that is, if we go on as we are doing now, that is, if we do business as usual, and on the other hand, we can also have a breakthrough to a world system which is of a higher order. And we can manage this breakthrough only through cooperative action. And here I come to the Global Sustainable Information Society. Slide number nine, please. The Global Sustainable Information Society is, um, is a vision but it's not a, a very detailed blueprint of a better future. It's rather a framework of requirements. That is, we need to um, establish uh, uh, these requirements, we need to implement these requirements in order to, um, to be uh, uh, on, on the good side of the Great Bifurcation. And so, as the term says, Global Sustainable Information Society, there are three, uh, three, propensities, three, three, three properties which are very essential for this. So, the first thing is, the change must redesign relations among all humans on Earth and between humans and nature and between humans and technology, as we learned. Uh, on the global challenges and we need to build up an integrative new world system that is a, a, a whole system which is now just uh, in start on which is just now in, 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 the, in the, the beginning of, 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 of coming uh, 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 of, uh, of, of coming out so uh, Therefore, globality is one essential property of these requirements. 
If we come to slide number 10, then uh, we come to the second uh, property. The change must establish safeguards against man-made dysfunctions, which might cause the collapse of the whole world system. That's the essential point. And this is a new definition, this is a systemic definition of sustainability. It's a definition in system theoretical terms. So a system is sustainable and that means a human humanity as a system, social systems of humans are sustainable if they have the means to uh, guarantee that the system does not collapse because of failures which are done by humans themselves. That's sustainability. Um, if we come to slide number 11, please. So we come to the third requirement. In order to know what ages uh, we have to implement, what mechanisms we have to implement to safeguard uh, the maintenance of the system, we uh, must allow for the creation uh, of knowledge and for the provision of all that knowledge that is necessary uh, to do it. That is, we must mobilize humanity's best intellectual capacities to gain knowledge that allows for the design of the required safeguards. And that is called informationality. That is, therefore, I'm talking of the information society. Uh, but you see that uh, it is knowledge, knowledge about how is sustainability uh, to be seen. Okay, thank you. So I come to the third chapter, um, which is global consciousness. Because if we talk about information, then global consciousness is also something uh, uh, which is uh, to be dealt with. So, in my system theoretical approach, there is a so-called model, a triple C model, because there are three, three C's. Um, the capital letters of cognition, communication and cooperation. These three things are information. All of them is information. That is social information which is uh, uh, happening, um, uh, which is uh, processed uh, in social systems or between social systems. Um, that's Social cognition, social communication, and social cooperation. Uh, yeah. But may I interrupt you just, just yes. a second? Because I, I think maybe if I do a, bit, a, a short clarification of what we was, uh, of what you have first thought, maybe they get to grasp better so the model of cognition, okay. communication, cooperation. Maybe okay. I just do a short clarification in Spanish. Yeah? Okay. Okay. Is it okay? Yeah? Uh, we can we okay. cannot see your camera. Can you turn it on? Or my camera is not turned on. No? It's not. Uh, oh my next. Ah, okay. Uh, okay. Wait a minute. Have you been able to understand a little bit? It is turned on. My camera is turned on. I'm sorry. Is it turned on? Yeah. So maybe turn it off and ah, turn it off. Here. No, sorry. Sorry, here it is. Uh, ¿Os parece bien? Hago una pequeña clarificación de lo que ha de lo que ha explicado la primera parte o sea, lo que aunque tenéis, tenéis, el, tenéis el resumen ahí pero, pero lo que, a lo que apunta Volgang es a que nos encontramos en un momento de una bifurcación en lo que respecta a la, a la multitud de crisis que, nos, que estamos confrontando la multidi, multidimensionalidad de esas crisis que afectan a lo, a lo económico, a lo político a lo medioambiental, a lo social a lo cultural y, y frente a tal, esa gran bifurcación a la que apunta es que bien el sistema podría, podría permanecer o podría continuarse en, en el, con las reglas del juego 
que han conducido a esa generación de, de esa crisis y hacer que el sistema colapse, o bien que también existe una, una posibilidad, dado los desarrollos que, ese, que, esa, que, es, que esa misma eh, desarrollo social, vamos, que esa misma situación social ha generado, que crea un conjunto de posibilidades a partir de las cuales podría construirse un esquema de funcionamiento distinto que trascendería el que ha conducido hasta ahí, que es lo que él llama la, la Global Information Society, Global Sustainable Information Society, o sea, sociedad de la información sostenible y global. Y respecto a ella, lo que, lo que dice es que debe, debe cumplir con, con tres elementos. Por una parte, ha de trascender lo que supone el mecanismo de funcionamiento de los estados-nación con, con todas las reglas económicas y políticas en juego que en cuanto tal sería, sería global eh, en cuanto a lo sostenible debe ofrecerse como una, una sostenibilidad en un sentido muy amplio que, que, que incorpore lo cultural, lo político, lo económico, lo, lo ecológico y lo, y lo tecnológico y lo tercero que es a lo que, a lo que se refiere con el informacionalismo eh, o el informacionalismo es que, es que serán o, o podemos considerar recursos informativos en el sentido más, más amplio eh, utilizando las tecnologías de la, de la información, las que podrían conducirnos a la creación de esa, de esa supuesta so, so, sociedad global sostenible que haya trascendido digamos ese esquema clásico y, lo que ahora, y de lo que ahora va a hablar es del, del modelo en el cual se, se, se apoyaría ese, esa supuesta so, sociedad eh, de la información sosteni, sostenible y global, que utiliza los recursos tecnológicos y los informacionales en sentido amplio, que incluye lo cultural, etc. Y, y, de ese, y de ese es el modelo de la Triple C, Triple C es, él fundó de hecho una revista que se llama así, Triple C, Communication, Cognition, Cooperation. ¿Eh? Comunicación, cognición, cooperación. De hecho, como veis, el propio, la, el propio esquema nuestro en general del curso tiene mucho que ver con ello. So, I just made a clarification. Ok, fine. Thank you. I just switched the light on because there is hard rain now outside. So, now, now we are in page 12. In yes. Page yes, page 12, which means the triple C model. Cognition, communication, cooperation, and I want to define this a little bit more, which is very important now if we come to slide number 13. So, here I want to define cognition, that is social cognition, cognition of humans, cognition in social systems. So, we speak of actors, actors are the social agents. So. We can call them just actors, these might be individuals or they might be collective um, actors. Um, so, and the cognizability is the ability to reflect. And to reflect what? To reflect one's own goals, to reflect the state in which an actor is and to reflect the way how the actor tries to reach the goals. So, cognition is something which, is, um, which has the perspective of the individual system, the system as individual system, the actor as individual system. Yeah? Cognition is the actualization of capabilities of actors of reflecting their own goals, the state they are in, and the way to reach the goals as individual systems. Okay? Slide number 14. Second, the communication. Communication is the actualization of capabilities of actors, of reflecting each other's reflection on goals states and ways in the interaction of individual systems. Yeah? So that's important. Um, communication is a kind of cognition, but what an actor tries to cognize is um, 
is is uh, is another actor, and uh, he tries to understand what the other actor uh, reflects uh, herself. That is how she reflects on her goals, how she reflects in which state she is in, and what are the ways in which she wants to reach the goals starting from the stage she is in. And this is something which is the content of the communication. And all of that is on the level of the interaction of actors as individual systems. Okay? Slide number 15. This is now the third C in the triple C model. That's I call it cooperation, but cooperation is meant here also as an as an uh, as an actualization of a capability, and this capability is also the capability of actors, and they are capable to reflect um, the goals uh, as something that they have in common with the other actors. They can reflect the states in which they are commonly and they can reflect the ways to reach the common goal, ways which they also share, that is, which they have in common. And so they reflect on another level, they reflect in the collective supra-system they are integrated with. It's on a higher level. It's on, the, it's on the level of the collective. It's on the level of the so-called supra-system. Supra-system is called because each actor is a system and to understand that uh, an actor is an element of this other system, it's called supra-system. So it's nothing, it's just a term. So you see that all these um, three C's Cognition, communication and cooperation is about information and it's information on different levels. It's a generation and sharing of information on different levels. And this third C is very important because unfortunately uh, it is uh, forgotten, so to say, in, in sociology. Okay, then let's turn uh, to uh, slide number 16, if uh, Jose is okay with it, yes? Yeah. It's but do you want to say something additional? No, okay? So, number 16. If we look now in the history of humankind, we will see that we had several uh, formations, uh, several types of formations of social cognition, communication and cooperation. You can fancy, you can imagine that cognition, communication and cooperation are somehow fitting together because one is the necessary uh, condition for the next. And uh, in history it was concretized in different ways. And how they have been concretized is between two poles. There's the pole of individualism and the pole of collectivism. And between these two poles, uh, these social formations have been oscillating so far. So we can discern a first stage, number 17. Slide number 17, please. This first stage I call tribalism. It's not only me, it's also other anthropologists, sociologists and so on who call it like that. <coughs> Tribalism is something which, uh, uh, which is characteristic of the dawn of humankind uh, when there were face-to-face -face groups and not big societies, not big anonymous societies. So, and we have here the three characteristics. The first characteristic is what's the relation between 
the actors, the systems, and the suprasystem they are integrated with. And we can say there is a we. The we stands for the suprasystem. It's a mystification. It's an all-embracing we. And any actor, any individual actor, works as personification of the we. So there is uh, a kind of very rigid structure in this. Uh, second um, uh, property here is there are myths. Uh, these myths convey the tradition and they are conveyed by communication and so these societies, uh, if they are already uh, called societies, they are traditional societies. So they are not very open to change. And this comes also here to the fore if we look about if we look at the third property uh, on means and ends. So means and ends are not questioned. Ends of what uh, the society does and how it does. It's not questioned, it's the same. So if we come now to slide number 18 we can see another stage of the development and you will uh, at the first, <laughs> um, at the first uh, uh, glance you may not understand why I call it idiotism. Uh, I call it idiotism because I found a book which was uh, published recently, um, an English book uh, which takes this word and it traces the word back to, uh, to the Greek um, uh, terms and uh, idiots were called those people in, in Athens and in, and in old Greece which just focus on their private things, on private matters and not on what is called res publica, not on politics, not on the public things. Yeah. So this is very interesting to to to, to see, and uh, also the Greek uh, the Greek antiquity is said to be the first uh, society in which individuals uh, became um, real individuals, which can in a way. Uh, um, Wait a minute. Betray. So it's betray. The term is betray, which can betray others. So it's the, for instance, the Odysseus. Odysseus is a character here, which is very important for that. So what I mean is, we have a slow process out from tribalism into a new social formation, to a new big social formation until today, which says that which which shows that actors are becoming persons and they are uh, unfolding as self-regarding persons. Yeah? They, they regard only themselves and not the other. And the structures of the suprasystem of the, of the concrete society they are in is to prioritize competition over cooperation. So on the lower level there is always competition uh, which is, uh, which is uh, allowed and which is promoted by the structure of the system on the higher level. There is ideology, that is the private, is the supreme good and neoliberalism is just that kind of, uh, of economic and political development uh, social development which uh, which brings this to accumulation and as to means and, uh, and ends um, it is interesting to notice that ends are not really questioned 
ends are given because the individuals are egoists and they just want to further what is good for them only and so they have short-sighted ends but uh, uh, as, uh, especially in particular the development of capitalism the means are more and more questioned and flexibilized that is uh, people think about can we have better means to serve the same aims Now we can come to a possible third stage. This is slide number 19. It's a possible stage, but it's a needful stage. And you know, this is just the stage that the framework of a global sustainable information society holds. And this stage can be called cosmopolitanism. If it's uh, a new cosmopolitanism, it's a real cosmopolitanism. And uh, we should try to get it here and now in order to avoid barbarism. What are the three properties, the three characteristics of cosmopolitanism? So what is the relationship of actors and uh, super-system? Um, they need, what, what is needed is a unity through diversity relationship between actors and the super system. That is, on the one hand, you need diversity, as we had it in the history so far, when we have different individuals with egoistic aims. But on the other hand, we should not forget about the unity. Therefore, unity is also needed. So we need unity and diversity in one. The collective reflection assures that the pursuit of individual goals does not harm other suprasystem components. That's the difference to the second stage formation, okay? Let's come to slide number 20. The second characteristic of cosmopolitanism is it is not a myth, it is not an ideology anymore, that is a wrong consciousness in that sense. No, it must be realistic. There must be an assessment, a true assessment of different development paths in order to know how we can maintain the whole world system and the whole society. And therefore we need also science and scientific thinking. Let's come to the third characteristics of cosmopolitanism, slide number 21. As to the means and ends, it's not only the means who are questioned, it's also the ends who are questioned here. And ends are agreed upon on. Uh, they are ag agreed upon by different actors. That is, and that's the most important thing here, actors are capacitated to reflect their own position as well as the position of others. And they do it from the perspective of the suprasystem. That's the difference here. That is, in the formation before, that is in the stage before, when we have egoistic individuals, you also do reflect uh, maybe position of the others, but you don't see it from the perspective of the suprasystem. You see it from your own perspective, from your own narrow perspective. And you think, does this other individual help my apes for getting profit or not? But here is the difference, that is, we live in one boat, so to say, we live on one planet and we have to live together and therefore we have to take into account all the interests of all the people who are living here. And therefore we need to view it from a bird's view. That is, what, how can we design society so as to 
do justice to every interest of all the people here. Okay, so uh, I come to the conclusion. Um, slide number 22. That is, uh, if I look at the program of this event, so uh, the other title is from communication to solidarity. And what I tried to show is that solidarity that is meant uh, as cooperation. It is a global sustainable information society. It is global consciousness and it is cosmopolitanism. And slide number 23, please, is the last, last but one slide. Um, we can have hope that humanity does the right decision, that all of us do the right thing in order to maintain civil, civilized life on Earth, because you can see there are four shadowings of the Global Sustainable Information Society. What is a foreshadowing? This is a term which, uh, it, which comes from philosopher Ernst Bloch, a German philosopher. And when I look in the program, I think tomorrow on Sunday, um, you might talk about him a little bit. So that is a foreshadowing is a, a real possibility which is realized already here and now and which shows that something can be different that you can have a different world that you can have another world that you can have a better world and this is just insulating it's just only like, like blossoms and what we need to do is to connect all these blossoms in order to get um, a leap in quality and to master the change, to master the transformation to a global sustainable information society. And uh, I want to uh, uh, tell you that uh, uh, Edgar Morin, the philosopher Edgar Morin, French philosopher, maybe you, you, you pronounce him Edgar Morin, um, he was uh, a guest of uh, our last conference in 2012 in Vienna and he talked about um, hope and he said, he, he brought an example, he brought an example from the fight against Nazism in the Second World War and he brought an example in which it was very improbable that, uh, um, that uh, victory uh, my last sentence is, uh, do you hear me? Yeah, yes, yes, perfect. Okay, the last sentence is, there is uh, imponderabilities, and there are events which are not very probable, but they might happen. This is what is called in system science, emergence. And therefore the whole thing is called emergentism. That is, things emerge, they can emerge, and uh, they do emerge without being, um, uh, uh, predetermined, yeah. And if there is one example now in actual international policy which shows this very good, uh, it's uh, Syria. It's the example of Syria, and you see that the United States and other countries wanted to uh, make a military strike against Syria, which is illegal. That is, uh, they wanted to bypass international law and the United Nations and uh, they say it is necessary, it is illegal, okay, but it is necessary, that is, it is legitimate. That's a policy of, of, the, of, of very strong Western countries in the last years, in the last decades, uh, to do things which are illegal but uh, allegedly uh, legitimate. I think they are not legitimate either, but that's not the point here. The point here is that there is a kind of strong relations which are developing, which are constrained for further 
uh, for further acting, for further acting of the global players. And so it happened that, uh, for instance, uh, uh, the, the foreign minister of the United States, Kerry, said something. Um, um, and he, 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 um, he, he, he said, he dropped this sentence about the chemical weapons and then, uh, then um, uh, Russia and, and Syria took this and they said, okay, yes, why not, let's do it. And so, uh, something could be avoided, that is, a military strike could be avoided, which is very important because a military strike would have worsened the whole situation and it would be not about chemical weapons, it would have been um, uh, um, taking part, taking party, being partisan in a civil war which is going on in Syria. Though there are already many uh, uh, soldiers from outside, and more than 30 states are involved in this. But you see that things can happen and this is also something which gives hope that uh, you see that something which was so imminent, the imminent danger of a military strike could be avoided. So, thank you. So you can show the last slide, uh, number 24, and thank you so much. Thank you.